My name is Anne Nicholson. I'm a professor in computer science at the, in the Faculty of IT at Monash University. I started off as a computer scientist doing a Bachelor of Science and I was always interested in artificial intelligence. Many years ago now, when I started doing my PhD work, I was in a robotics research group doing robot monitoring and then that's when I came across BayesNets. It was really early in the days of Bayesian networks and I feel very fortunate that I got in on the ground, so to speak, when they were just an emerging technology. It was very exciting. So over the years at Monash, I've worked and done research in many areas of AI, user modelling, um, probabilistic reasoning in general, but kept coming back to BayesNets. And then 10 or more years ago, in the early 2000s, it became really clear that BayesNets were a, becoming a very mature technology from an AI point of view, where people in other domain areas were really looking at them to help them solve their problem. When they had uncertainty, when they wanted to pull together different pieces of information, build a model they could understand that wasn't just a black box, well, Bayesian networks had all those features. And I was doing research in this area and doing a lot of cross-disciplinary research, but we also were interested in getting it out there in the industry of people solving problems who didn't care about the research side, just wanted to get the answers. So with one of my colleagues, we decided to set up a consulting company to deliver solutions, BayesNet solutions for people that were interested, that didn't care about the research side, but just wanted a really powerful tool that could uh, give them the features that they needed. Around uh, the same time, we also realised that as computer scientists, it didn't do any good just to talk to computer scientists about BayesNets. We needed to talk to the people that were doing the modelling, the people in environmental science, in other sciences, in business and finance and so on, where they wanted to use BayesNet models. We needed a forum where we could come together regularly to swap um, stories, models, learn from each other and so on. So the Australasian Bayesian Network Modelling Society it's not a computer science society, it's not just about research, it's about taking Bayes nets and de developing real solutions to real problems. So we work with a lot of people from different areas. Okay, in your consulting business, you use Bayesian net models to solve problems in applied science, of course. Can you describe an example problem and how Bayesian networks were used in its solution? Mm. One of our early consulting projects was working with what was then the Department of Sustainability and Environment in Victoria. They had an online system for recording in a database what they were doing dealing with threatened species. They had an obligation to kind of track and monitor and try and protect that threatened species. But they didn't really have a way of modelling what they were trying to do, um, really, and helping them evaluate how good their actions were. So what we did is we sat down with them to build some Bayes nets where we were explicitly capturing the relationships between the threats to those species, the actions that the management might take to mitigate those threats, and then connecting them to the outcomes for the species or habitat that were the things they were going to be tracking. So we built those Bayes net models using some data but with expert elicitation as a web-based front-end tool because we don't expect the people who are out there being the monitors of each threatened species in each environment to be experts in base nets. But underneath there were these quite powerful small models that did some predictions and then as they gathered data over time, could be entered in, we could compare and see when the model hadn't worked right. Was that some misunderstanding? Were the mitigating actions not working? Were they getting best bang for their buck and so on? So that uh, was an example of how we've used base nets for environmental management. And how many base nets are involved in that system? Actually, it was pretty challenging because they have to manage and monitor hundreds of base nets. So clearly, if we spent sort of six months building one base net for one species, that wasn't going to work. So what we did is we hooked into their existing database where they had the actions and the threats and the outcomes already in there and we built a front end to walk them through identifying the key actions and threats and outcomes, linking them together, which we did behind the scenes, and then they could enter evidence and visualise some of the outputs. Um, and we basically, I think in six months or so when they first trialled using the system, they built more than 50 base nets and I think they're now up over 100. So they're actively using this? Yes, it's part of their uh, ongoing um, rep monitoring and reporting of the threatened species. They have a requirement to do that and it's embedded now in their, their whole tool and their whole framework. 
That's fantastic. It must be a good feeling of satisfaction to have your work being used that way. Yes, yes, I think that's right. There was one small element, and this is a word of warning for people doing any sort of Bayes net modelling and data science, that really we didn't plan the evaluation early enough, and also when they wanted to get in there and just start using it, I'm not sure that we did the best evaluation along the way because they were just basically taking it and using it and we didn't structure the evaluation right. So that's the one thing you would have done differently, eh? Yeah, that's right. Um, I guess it's really hard to plan evaluation at the start when you don't even really understand the scope of the problem and how you're going to solve it. But um, we've learned subsequently to factor that in, in earlier in our modelling stages. So that leads us to how you go about developing a model. Well, what's the process? Well, for every problem, it's a little bit different, um, but we do have a, a reasonably standard set of uh, steps that we try and take. So we try and set it up with a bit of a scientific methodology, but of course there's a bit of art to it as well. So the key thing is to talk to the people who want to build the network and want to look at the outputs of the net network and find out what problem is it are they really trying to solve? Are they trying to predict something? diagnose something, do they want to just compare scenarios, do they want to evaluate different management strategies and so on. You have to find out what problem they're trying to solve, what the key output variables will be. When you run a Bayes net and you're generating posterior probability distributions over a whole lot of variables, which are the key ones that they want to know about? So they're going to be the output variables. And then what are the inputs going to be? And they're the evidence or the observation variables. So they're your key things, like what's the problem? What are your inputs and outputs going to be? And then what are the variables are going to be needed to be included in the model to make it uh, a useful salient model? So once you've uh, identified what are likely to be the key variables you need to include in your network as nodes, then the next stage of course is developing the structure of the network, which means identifying the causal relationships between the variables. And then once you've got your structure, then obviously you have to parameterize it, which is getting your conditional probability distributions or tables. So there's a, there's a sequence of steps, but what I really want to emphasize is that it, you don't just go through and do it once. It's a bit like in software development, the old waterfall method of requirements, analysis, design, um, coding, testing, and then that's it. It doesn't work anymore. You cannot do a single pass through the steps of model building because you don't understand enough how the problem, things change. As you start evaluating partial solutions or your early prototypes, you have different understanding of it and so on. So there's a lot of evaluation along the way. You don't wait to the end to test the model. You're testing and validating aspects of the model all the way along, trying to build up simple prototypes and expanding them and doing it incrementally and iteratively. So what's the relative importance of experts versus data? Experts versus data, okay. Well, it, again, it really depends on the problem. And if there is data, well then that's great and you can use that and you should use that. I mean, great data gives you sort of ground truth for testing against and so on. And we've also got methods for automatically learning the structure of the BaseNet model and as well as doing the parameterizing from the data. So if you think that you've got enough data and you think it's mm, unbiased and so on, then obviously you should be using the data that you've got. But sometimes the data's patchy. You only have it about some variables or only small numbers of samples, in which case, you need to use your experts to fill in those gaps to help you uh, understand the interactions in the system which you might not be able to uh, data mine and also to fill in with some of the parameterization of some variables in the system that you've never um, measured before. I mean one example might be if you've got a network that's about an environmental problem, uh, what will happen if you dam a river and what will happen to the species in that river. Well no one's been out there damming a thousand rivers over a certain number of years and collecting the data to see what happened to those species. You have to use the experts knowledge, their intuition, their understanding about some specific aspects of breeding um, and population growth and how um, the species responds to different uh, changes in their habitat but you have to capture them. They're not going to be in the data because it just hasn't happened. Um, tell us a little bit about sensitivity analysis and its role in this um, uh, life cycle of model development. Mm. Sensitivity analysis is really a part of the validation or evaluation of the model. What it is, is a general term that is about if you change something, an input to the model or one of its parameters, how sensitive are the outputs of the model to that change? One kind of sensitivity analysis is if you change the inputs 
or the values of the, your observation variables, how much would that change you know, the output of your key target variables or how much would it change the decision if you've embedded it in a decision network. The other thing would be to say which of the parameters in the model, which is the values in these probabilities in the CPTs, which ones of those, if they change value, will be enough to make a significant change in the key output variables? So why do, why do we care about this? One is we like to know that the model is reasonably robust to these sort of changes, and often we're interested in it at changes in a reasonably sensible or smooth manner. This is part of our mm, accepting that the system behaves in a, in a, in a system, sensible way. It may well be that there are thresholds in the real world that our model is capturing, that at some point there's some combination of things that tip things over and all of a sudden the world's behaving differently and the model accepts that. So it's not that you have to have smooth change all the time, but you have to know that if you're getting these sudden shifts that it's actually reflecting something real because of our model is just trying to be a capturing a real world system in a way that's useful for decision making. So that's um, that sensitivity analysis. Okay. So where do you think uh, the field of Bayesian network technology is headed? For? What are the big changes uh, coming along in the medium term, 5, 10, 15 years? Mm. There's a lot of hype, obviously, at the moment about big data, and big data is real. It's not clear yet that we've really incorporated that into Bayesian network technology. In terms of the number of variables, we're still working out how to scale up from tens to hundreds of variables. Um, we haven't really got there with thousands, at least of really complex modelling between the thousands. There's, there's models that are out there that are fairly uh, simplistic, uh, small-scale relationships between a very large number of variables. I think we also, as we scale up and get more complex models, we need to do better about visualisation. Some of that's to do with uh, visualising the model as it stands so that we have a better understanding of it. You're, you're, the people you're working with who are going to use it, if they don't understand the model and how it all fits together, won't use it for their decision making. And so visualisation of the model and its outputs, like all those probabilities that have been spewed out from all those output variables, you know, how can they be presented in a way that makes it very tractable and understandable? Because one of the advantages of Bayes nets is that they are causal models, they're not black boxes, they're supposed to represent the system and be able to be understood. But once you get up to a certain size and too many probabilities, then you kind of lose that advantage of um, e explanation and understandability. So that's a challenge for us. So why Bayes nets, not other sorts of models? Yeah. Well, first of all, I started off and I was looking at a problem that had a lot of uncertainty in it. I was looking at uh, tracking robots and uh, monitoring them and so on. And it's just not the case that you can have a rule-based system that says, if this happens, then that, then that. You know, in, in any sort of real-world domain where we're interacting with the sensors, when there's uncertainty in the outcomes of actions, we need to be able to build models and systems that represent that uncertainty. And obviously that's what Bayes nets give you. And it's not representation of uncertainty as happened in some of the expert systems in the 80s, a long time ago, but that's what AI systems used to do, was to put in these sort of certainty factors. And really, they didn't have any real semantics. They were just fudge-factored numbers, and when you combine them, they had no real meaning, and you couldn't really rely on them. So BayesNets, because they're based on probability theory, have very sound mathematical foundations, if you've got your model right, and then you put in information and look at the numbers that come out from combining all your observations, you can say that those are correct probabilities. Of course, as with any sort of modelling, uh, if your model's not correct, if you haven't got it right, then you won't get sensible answers. But as for the quality of the model, the BayesNet technology gives you answers that you can rely on. So that's one aspect. The other is that they're very powerful in that they're flexible. You can use them to capture a system and then you can ask questions of it to reason forward into the future for prediction. You can give observations that are really evidence of things you've observed and then reason back to the causes of it, or then you can mix those in any way. So that sort of forward, backward and mixed reasoning is very flexible and it really means that as a technology it can be applied to a huge range of problem domains environmental modelling, weather forecasting, finance, any, anywhere where there is complex systems, combination of information and uncertainty, you can build a BayesNet to help you reason about it and make decisions. BayesNets have been around starting from the research communities for more than 25 years. They've now got to the stage where the algorithms 
the code, the methods for doing the belief updating for both exact and approximate are pretty fast. There's not really that limitation now in terms of speed. We've got a lot of methods out there for learning structure and parameters, and it's still an active area of research, but there's been enough um, techniques and methods and algorithms that have come from the research community and now in commercially available and open source tools to make it accessible to people from other problem domains who want to apply it as a reasonably uh, robust, well-supported, off-the-shelf technology. So one of the things that um, really annoys me when I hear people say this about Bayes Nets is they say that because it's a directed acyclic graph, which means that you can't start off from one node and draw arrows around back to the same node, they say then that, well, I can't model a feedback loop, so I can't use it for my problem. And this just really isn't true. If you want to model change over time, there's a very simple way of repeating the Bayes net structure so that you're keeping a copy for each variable for each point of time you're interested in and then all the algorithms and methods for ordinary Bayes net modeling apply. So these are dynamic Bayes nets and they're just made for modeling uh, feedback systems. Another misconception about Bayesian nets I think that's out there is that they're just a quantitative method. So some people, they're not very keen on numbers or they don't think there's not enough data and they say, I can't use Bayesian nets, it's a quantitative approach and we need to use more like a qualitative, semi-qualitative approach. Okay, so there's a couple of aspects to that. The first is that the Bayesian net structure by itself is a representation of the, a causal model or a conceptual model. So before you put the numbers into the tables, it is really a qualitative model in that sense. Then whether you uh, add the numbers in and then when it becomes quantitative, you can still uh, abstract away, you can use qualitative labels for how you enter things into your CPTs and so on. So it really is covering the spectrum from qualitative aspects to full on number crunching. Um, and I don't think it should be dismissed by people who are a bit afraid of quantitative methods.